Chapter 5. There were bushes, scrub and bramble for the most part, growing here and there along the base of the cliff, and they quickly fanned out with their swords to gather enough to build a large, smoky fire. You'd better hurry, Belgarath called to them as they worked. There are a dozen Murgos or more already halfway down the ravine. Dernick, who had been gathering dry sticks and splintered bits of log, ran back to the mouth of the ravine, knelt, and began striking sparks from his flint into the tinder he always carried. In a few moments, he had a small fire going, the orange flames licking up around the weathered gray sticks. Carefully, he added larger pieces until his fire was a respectable blaze. Then he began piling thorn bushes and brambles atop it, critically watching the direction of the smoke. The bushes hissed and smoldered fitfully at first, and a great cloud of smoke wafted this way and that for a moment, then began to pour steadily up the ravine. Dernick nodded with satisfaction. Just like a chimney, he observed. From up the cut came shouts of alarm, and a great deal of coughing and choking. How long can a man breathe smoke before he chokes to death? Silk asked. Not very long, Dernick replied. I didn't think so. The little man looked happily at the smoking blaze. Good fire, he said, holding his hands out to the warmth. The smoke's going to delay them, but I think it's time to move on out, Belgrass said, squinting at the cloud-obscured ball of the sun hanging low over the horizon to the west. Let's move on up the face of the escarpment and then make a run for it. We'll want to surprise them a bit to give us time to get out of range before they start throwing rocks down on us. Is there any sign of Hedder out there? Beric asked, peering out at the grassland. We haven't seen any yet, Derdick replied. You do know that we're going to lead half of Thal Murgos into the plain, Beric pointed out to Belgrath. That can't be helped, for right now we've got to get out of here. If Tar Urgas is up there, he is going to send people after us, even if he has to throw them off the cliff personally. Let's go. They followed to the face of the cliff for a mile or more, until they found a spot where the rockfall did not extend so far out onto the plain. This will do, Belgarath decided. As soon as we get to level ground, we ride hard straight out. An arrow shot off the top of that cliff will carry a long way. Is everybody ready? He looked around at them. Let's move, then. They led their horses down the short, steep slope of rock to the grassy plain below, mounted quickly, and set off at a dead run. Arrow! Silk said sharply, looking up and back over his shoulder. Garion, without thinking, slashed with his will at the tiny speck arching down toward them. In the same instant, he felt a peculiar double surge coming from either side of him. The arrow broke into several pieces in midair. If you two don't mind, Belgarath said irritably to Garion and Aunt Paul, half reining in his horse. I just didn't want you to tire yourself, father. Aunt Paul replied coolly. I'm sure Garion feels the same way. Couldn't we discuss it later, Silk suggested, looking apprehensively back at the towering escarpment. They plunged on, the long brown grass whipping at the legs of their horses. Other arrows began to fall, dropping farther and farther behind them as they rode. By the time they were a half mile out from the sheer face, the arrows were sheeting down from the top of the cliff in a whistling black rain. Persistent, aren't they? Silk observed. It's a racial trait, Beric replied. Murgos are stubborn to the point of idiocy. Keep going, Belgraf told them. It's just a question of time until they bring up a catapult. They're throwing ropes down the face of the cliff, Dernick reported, peering back at the escarpment. As soon as a few of them get to the bottom, they'll pull the fire clear of the ravine and start bringing horses down. At least it slowed them down a bit, Belgraf said. Twilight, hardly more than a gradual darkening of the cloudy murk that had obscured the sky for several days, began to creep across the Algarian plain. They rode on. Garion glanced back several times as he rode and noticed moving pinpoints of light along the base of the cliff. Some of them have reached the bottom, Grandfather, he called to the old man who was pounding along in the lead. I can see their torches. It was bound to happen, the sorcerer replied. It was nearly midnight by the time they reached the Alder River, lying black and oily-looking between its frosty banks. "'Does anybody have any idea how we're going to find the ford in the dark?' Dernick asked. "'I'll find it,' Relic told him. "'It isn't all that dark for me. Wait here.' "'That should give us a certain advantage,' Silk noted. "'We'll be able to ford the river, but the Murgles will flounder around on this side in the dark for half the night. We'll be leagues ahead of them before they get across.' That was one of the things I was sort of counting on, 
Belgarath replied smugly. It was a half an hour before Rel returned. It isn't far, he told them. They remounted and rode through the chill darkness, following the curve of the riverbank, until they reached the unmistakable gurgle and wash of water running over stones. That's it just ahead, Relg said. It'll be dangerous fording in the dark, Beric pointed out. It isn't that dark, Relg said. Just follow me. He rode confidently, a hundred yards further upriver, then turned and nudged his horse into the shallow rippling water. Garion felt his horse flinch from the icy chill as he rode out into the river, following closely behind Belgarath. Behind him, he heard Dernick coaxing the now unburdened pack animals into the water. The river was not deep, but it was very wide, almost a half mile, and in the process of fording, they were all soaked to the knees. The rest of the night promises to be moderately unpleasant, Silk observed, shaking one sodden boot. At least you've got the river between you and Targas, Beric reminded him. That does brighten things up a bit, Silk admitted. They had not gone a half mile, however, before Mandorallan's charger went down with a squeal of agony. The knight, with a great clatter, tumbled in the grass as he was pitched out of the saddle. His great horse floundered with thrashing legs, trying futilely to rise. What's the matter with him? Beric demanded sharply. Behind them, with another squeal, one of the pack horses collapsed. What is it? Garion asked Dernick, his voice shrill. It's the cold, Dernick answered, swinging from his saddle. We've rid of them to exhaustion, and then we made them wade across the river. The chills settled into their muscles. What do we do? We have to rub them down, all of them, with wool. We don't have time for that, Silk objected. It's that or walk, Dernick declared, pulling off his stout wool cloak and beginning to rub vigorously at his horse's legs with it. Maybe we should build a fire, Garen suggested, also dismounting and beginning to rub down his horse's shivering legs. There isn't anything around here to burn, Dernick told him. This is all open grassland. And a fire would set a beacon for every murgo within ten miles, Beric added, massaging the legs of his grey horse. They all worked as rapidly as possible, but the sky to the east had begun to pale with the first hints of dawn before Mandarallan's horse was on his feet again, and the rest of their mounts were able to move. They won't be able to run, Dernick declared somberly. We shouldn't even ride them. Dernick, Silk protested, Tar Urgas is right behind us. They won't last a league if we try to make them run, the smith said stubbornly. There's nothing left in them. They rode away from the river at a walk. Even at that pace, Garion could feel the trembling of his horse under him. They all looked back frequently, watching the dark shrouded plain beyond the river as the sky grew gradually lighter. When they reached the top of the first low hills, the deep shadow which had obscured the grasslands behind them faded, and they were able to see movement. Then, as the light grew stronger, they saw an army of Murgos swarming toward the river. In the midst of them were the flapping black banners of Tar Urgas himself. The Murgos came on in waves until they reached the far bank of the river. Then their mounted scouts ranged out until they located the ford. The bulk of the army Tar Urgas had brought down to the plain was still on foot, but clusters of horses were being driven up from the river as rapidly as they could be brought down the narrow cut leading from the top of the escarpment. As the first units began splashing across the ford, Silk turned to Belgrath. Now what? the little man asked in a worried voice. We'd better get off the top of this hill, the old man replied. I don't think they've seen us yet, but it's just a question of time, I'm afraid. They rode down into a little swale just beyond the hill. The overcast, which had obscured the sky for the past week or more, had begun to blow off, and broad patches of pale icy blue had begun to appear, though the sun had not yet come up. My guess is that he's going to hold the bulk of his army on this far side, Belgrath told them after they had all dismounted. He'll bring them on across as their horses catch up. As soon as they get to this side, they're going to spread out to look for us. That's the way I'd do it, Beric agreed. Somebody ought to keep an eye on them, Dernick suggested. He started back up the hill on foot. I'll let you know if they start doing anything unusual. Belgarath seemed lost in thought. He paced up and down, his hands clasped together behind his back and an angry look on his face. This isn't working out the way I'd expected, he said finally. I hadn't counted on the horses playing out on us. 
Is there any place we can hide? Beric asked. Belgrass shook his head. This is all grassland, he replied. There aren't any rocks or caves or trees, and it's going to be impossible to cover our tracks. He kicked at the tall grass. This isn't turning out too well, he admitted glumly. We're all alone out here on exhausted horses. He chewed thoughtfully at his lower lip. The nearest help is in the Vale. I think we'd better turn south and make for it. We're fairly close. How close? Silk asked. Ten leagues or so. That's going to take all day, Belgrath. I don't think we've got that long. We might have to tamper with the weather a bit, Belgrath conceded. I don't like doing that, but I might not have any choice. There was a distant low rumble somewhere off to the north. The little boy looked up and smiled at Aunt Paul. Errand? he asked. Yes, dear, she replied absently. Can you pick up any traces of Algars in the vicinity, Paul? Belgarath asked her. She shook her head. I think I'm too close to the Orb, Father. I keep getting an echo that blots things out more than a mile or so away. It's always been noisy, he grunted sourly. Talk to it, Father, she suggested. Maybe it will listen to you. He gave her a long, hard look. A look she returned quite calmly. I can do without that, miss, he told her finally in a crisp voice. There was another low rumble from the south this time. Thunder? Silk said, looking a bit puzzled. Isn't this an odd time of year for it? This plain breeds peculiar weather, Belgras said. There isn't anything between here and Drasnia but 800 leagues of grass. Do we make for the Vale, then? Beric asked. It looks as if we'll have to, the old man replied. Dernick came back down the hill. They're coming across the river, he reported, but they aren't spreading out yet. It looks as if they want to get more men across before they start looking for us. How hard can, how hard can we push the horses without hurting them? Silk asked him. Not very, Dernick replied. It would be better to save them until we absolutely have to use up whatever they've got left. If we walk and lead them for an hour or so, we might be able to get a canter out of them for short periods of time. Let's go along the back side of the crest, Belgrath said, picking up the reins of his horse. We'll stay pretty much out of sight that way, but I want to keep an eye on Tar Urgas. He led them at an angle back up out of the swale. The clouds had broken even more now, and the tatters raced in the endless winds that swept the vast grassland. To the east, the sky was turning a pale pink. Although the Algarian plague did not have that bitter, arid chill that had cut at them in the uplands of Thalmergos and Mishrak Akthal, it was still very cold. Garion shivered, drew his cloak in tight about him, and kept walking, trailing his weary horse behind him. There was another brief rumble, and a little boy perched in the saddle of Aunt Paul's horse laughed. Errand, he announced. I wish he'd stop that, Silk said irritably. They glanced from time to time over the crest of the long hill as they walked. Below in the broad valley of the Alder River, the Murgos of Tar Urgas were fording in larger and larger groups. It appeared that fully half his army had reached the west bank by now, and the red and black standard of the king of the Murgos stood planted defiantly on Algarian soil. If he brings too many more men down the escarpment, it's going to take something pretty significant to dislodge him. Beric rumbled, scowling down at the Murgos. I know, Belgarath replied. And that's the one thing I've wanted to avoid. We aren't ready for a war just yet. The sun, huge and red, ponderously moved up from behind the eastern escarpment, turning the sky around it rosy in the still-shadowed valley below them. The Murgos continued to splash across the river in the steely morning light. Methinks he will await the sun before he begins the search for us, Menderalan observed. And that's not very far off, Beric agreed, glancing at the slowly moving band of sunlight, just touching the hill along which they moved. We've probably got half an hour at the most. I think it's getting to the point where we're going to have to gamble on the horses. Maybe if we switch mounts every mile or so, we can get some more distance out of them. The rumble that came then could not possibly have been thunder. The ground shook with it, and it rolled on and endlessly from both the north and south. And then, pouring over the crests of the hills, surrounding the valley of the Alder like some vast tide suddenly released by the bursting of a mighty dam, 
came the clans of the Algars. Down they plunged upon the startled Murgos thickly clustered along the banks of the river, and their great war cry shook the very heavens as they fell like wolves upon the divided army of Tar Urgas. A lone horseman veered out of the great charge of the clans and came pounding up the hillside toward Garion and his friends. As the warrior drew closer, Garion could see his long scalp locked flowing behind him and his drawn saber catching the first rays of the morning sun. It was Heder. A vast surge of relief swept over Garion. They were safe. Where have you been? Beric demanded in a great voice as the hawk-faced Algar rode closer. Watching, Heder replied calmly as he reined in. We wanted to let the Murgos get out of a... We wanted to let the Murgos get out a ways from the escarpment so we could cut them off. My father sent me to see how you all are. How considerate, Silk observed sardonically. Did it ever occur to you to let us know you were out there? Hatter shrugged. We could see that you were all right. He looked critically at their exhausted mounts. You didn't take very good care of them, he said accusingly. We were a bit pressed, Dernick apologized. Did you get the orb? The tall man asked Belgrath, glancing hungrily down toward the river where a vast battle had been joined. It took a bit, but we got it, the old sorcerer replied. Good. Hedder turned his horse, and his lean face had a fierce look on it. I'll tell Shohag. Will you excuse me? Then he stopped as if remembering something. Oh, he said to Beric. Congratulations, by the way. For what? The big man asked, looking puzzled. The birth of your son. What? Beric sounded stunned. How? In the usual way, I'd imagine, Hedder replied. I mean, how did you find out? Angaheg said word to us. When was he born? A couple of months ago. Hedder looked nervously down at the battle, which was raging on both sides of the river, and in the middle of the ford as well. I really have to go, he said. If I don't hurry, there won't be any Murgos left. And he drove his heels into his horse's flanks and plunged down the hill. He hasn't changed a bit, Silk noted. Beric was standing with a somewhat foolish grin on his big red bearded face. Congratulations, my lord, Manderolin said to him, clasping his hand. Beric's grin grew broader. It quickly became obvious that the situation of the encircled Murgos below was hopeless. With his army cut in two by the river, Tarurgas was unable to mount even an orderly retreat. The forces he had brought across the river were quickly swarmed under by King Chohag's superior numbers, and the few survivors of the short, ugly melee plunged back into the river, protectively drawn up around the red and black banner of the Murgo king. Even in the ford, however, the Algar warriors pressed him. Some distance upriver, Garin could see horsemen plunging into the icy water to be carried down by the current to the shallows of the ford in an effort to cut off escape. Much of the fight in the river was obscured by the sheets of spray kicked up by struggling horses, but the bodies floating downstream testified to the savagery of the clash. Briefly, for no more than a moment, the red and black banner of Tar Urgas was confronted by the burgundy and white horse banner of King Chohag, and then the two were swept apart. That would have been an interesting meeting, Silk noted. Chohag and Tar Urgas have hated each other for years. Once the King of the Murgos regained the East Bank, he rallied what forces he could, turned, and fled back across the open grassland toward the escarpment with Algar clansmen hotly pursuing him. For the bulk of his army, however, there was no escape. Since their horses had not yet descended the narrow ravine from the top of the escarpment, they were forced to fight on foot. The Algars swept down upon them in waves, sabers flashing in the morning sun. Faintly, Garion could hear the screams. Sickened, finally, he turned away, unable to watch the slaughter any longer. The little boy, who was standing close beside Aunt Paul with his hand in hers, looked at Garion gravely. Errand, he said with a sad conviction. By mid-morning, the battle was over. The last of the Murgos on the far bank of the river had been destroyed, and Tar Urgas had fled with the tattered remnants of his army back up the ravine. Good fight, Beric observed professionally, looking down at the bodies littering both banks of the river and bobbing limply in the shallows downstream from the ford. The tactics of thy Algar cousins were masterly, Mandarolan agreed. Tarurgas will take some time to recover from this morning's chastisement, 
I'd give a great deal to see the look on his face just now, Silka laughed. He's probably frothing at the mouth. King Chohag, dressed in steel-plated black leather, and with his horse banner streaming triumphantly in the bright morning sun, came galloping up the hill toward them, closely surrounded by the members of his personal guard. Interesting morning, he said with typical Algar understatement as he reined in. Thanks for bringing us so many Murgos. He's as bad as Hedder, Silk observed to Beric. The king of the Algars grinned openly as he slowly dismounted. His weak legs seemed almost to buckle as he casually put his weight on them, and he held onto his saddle for support. How did things go in Rakthal? he asked. It wound up being rather noisy, Belgrath replied. Did you find two chicken good health? Moderately. We corrected that, however. The whole affair set off an earthquake. Most of Rakthal slid off its mountain top, I'm afraid. Chohag grinned. What a shame. Where's Hedar? Beric asked. Chasing Murgos, I imagine, Chohag replied. Their rear guard got cut off, and they're out there trying to find some place to hide. There aren't very many hiding places on this plane, are there? Beric asked. Almost none at all, the Algar king agreed pleasantly. A dozen or so Algar wagons crested a nearby hill, rolling toward them through the tall brown grass. They were square-boxed conveyances, looking not unlike houses on wheels. They had roofs, narrow windows, and steps at the rear looking up at the doorway on the back of each wagon. It looked, Garion thought, almost like a moving city as they approached. I imagine Hedar is going to be a while, Chohag noted. Why don't we have a bit of lunch? I'd like to get word to Enheg and Rodar about what's happening here as soon as possible, but I'm sure you'll want to pass a few things along as well. We could talk while we eat. Several of the wagons were drawn up close together, and their sides were let down and joined to form a spacious, low-ceilinged dining hall. Braziers provided warmth, and candles illuminated the interior of the quickly assembled hall, supplementing the bright winter sunlight streaming in through the windows. They dined on roasted meat and mellow ale. Garion soon found that he was wearing far too many clothes. It seemed that he had not been warm in months, and the glowing braziers simmered out a welcome heat. Although he was tired and very dirty, he felt warm and safe, and he soon found himself nodding over his plate, almost drowsing as Belgrath recounted the story of their escape to the Algar king. Gradually, however, as the old man spoke, something alerted Garion. There was, it seemed, a trace too much vivacity in his grandfather's voice, and Belgrath's words sometimes seemed almost to stumble over each other. His blue eyes were very bright, but seemed occasionally a bit unfocused. So Zadar got away, Chohag was saying. That's the only thing that mars the whole affair. Zadar's no problem, Belgrath replied, smiling in a slightly dazed way. His voice seemed strange, uncertain, and King Chohag looked at the old man curiously. You've had a busy year, Belgrath, he said. A good one, though. The sorcerer smiled again and lifted his ale cup. His hand was trembling violently, and he stared at it in astonishment. Aunt Paul, Garin called urgently. Are you all right, father? Fine, Paul. Perfectly fine. He smiled vaguely at her, his unfocused eyes blinking owlishly. He rose suddenly to his feet and began to move toward her, but his steps were lurching, almost staggering, and then his eyes rolled back in his head and he fell to the floor like a pole-axed cow. Father, Aunt Paul exclaimed, leaping to his side. Garion, moving almost as fast as his aunt, knelt on the other side of the unconscious old man. What's wrong with him? he demanded, but Aunt Paul did not answer. Her hands were at Belgrath's wrist and brow, feeling for his pulse. She peeled back one of his eyelids and stared intently into his blank, unseeing eyes. Dernick! she snapped. Get my herb bag, quickly! The smith bolted for the door. King Chohag had half risen, his face deathly pale. He isn't... No, she answered tersely. He's alive, but only barely. Is someone attacking him? Silk was on his feet, looking around wildly, his hand unconsciously on his dagger. No, it's nothing like that. Aunt Paul's hands had moved to the old man's chest. I should have known, she berated herself. The stubborn, proud old fool. I should have been watching him. 
Please, Aunt Paul, Garen begged desperately. What's wrong with him? He never really recovered from his fight with Tuchik, she replied. He's been forcing himself, drawing on his will. Then those rocks in the ravine. But he wouldn't quit. Now he's burned up all his vital energy and will. He barely has enough strength left to keep breathing. Garion had lifted his grandfather's head and cradled it on his lap. Help me, Garion! He knew instinctively what she wanted. He gathered his will and held out his hand to her. She grasped it quickly, and he felt the force surge out of him. Her eyes were very wide as she intently watched the old man's face. Again! And once more, she pulled the quickly gathered will out of him. What are we doing? Garion's voice was shrill. Trying to replace some of what he had lost. Maybe, she glanced toward the door. Hurry, Dernick, she shouted. Dernick rushed back into the wagon. Open the bag, she instructed, and give me the black jar, the one that's sealed with lead, and a pair of iron tongs. Should I open the jar, Mistress Paul? The smith asked. No, just break the seal, carefully, and give me a glove, leather if you can find one. Wordlessly, Silk pulled a leather gauntlet from under his belt and handed it to her. She pulled it on, opened the black jar, and reached inside with the tongs. With great care, she removed a single dark, oily-looking green leaf. She held it very carefully in the tongs. Pry his mouth open, Garion, she ordered. Garion wedged his fingers between Belgarath's clenched teeth and carefully pried the old man's jaws apart. Aunt Paul pulled down her father's lower lip, reached inside his mouth with the shiny leaf, and lightly brushed his tongue with it once and only once. Belgarath jumped violently and his feet suddenly scraped on the floor. His muscles heaved and his arms began to flail about. Hold him down, Aunt Paul commanded. She pulled back sharply and held the leaf out of the way while Mandarolin and Beric jumped in to hold down Belgarath's convulsing body. Give me a bowl, she ordered, a wooden one. Dernick handed her one and she deposited the leaf and the tongs in it. Then with great care, she took off the gauntlet and laid it atop the leaf. Take this, she told the smith. Don't touch any part of the glove. What do you want me to do with it, Mistress Paul? Take it out and burn it, bowl and all, and don't let anyone get into the smoke from it. Is it that dangerous? Silk asked. It's even worse, but those are the only precautions we can take out here. Dernick swallowed very hard and left the wagon, holding the bowl as if it were a live snake. Pulgara took a small mortar and pestle and began grinding certain herbs from her bag into a fine powder as she watched Belgarath intently. How far is it to the stronghold, Chohag? She asked the Algar king. A man on a good horse could make it in half a day, he replied. How long by a wagon driven carefully to avoid bouncing? Two days. She frowned, still mixing the herbs in the mortar. All right, there's no help for it, I guess. Please send Hedar to Queen Silar. Have him tell her that I'm going to need a warm, well-lighted chamber with a good bed and no drafts. Dernick, I want you to drive the wagon. Don't hit any bumps, even if it means losing an hour. The smith nodded. He's going to be all right, isn't he? Beric asked, his voice drained and his face shocked by Belgrath's sudden collapse. It's really too early to say, she replied. He's been on the point of collapse for days, maybe, but he wouldn't let himself go. I think he's past this crisis, but there may be others. She laid one hand on her father's chest. Put him in bed carefully. Then I want a screen of some kind around the bed. Blankets will do. We have to keep him very quiet and out of drafts. No loud noises. They all stared at her as the significance of her extreme precautions struck them. Move, gentlemen, she told them firmly. His life may depend on a certain speed.